I cannot wait for tonight to begin so that I could share my story with you. I know what you're coming with. My heart has been heavy all day praying for you because I know very well that a woman who's coming to a webinar for food strongholds comes hoping that there's going to be some hope. And so that's my goal for you tonight, that in hearing my story, you're going to identify your story and you're going to go home with some hope or you're already home. So you're going to leave the webinar with some hope. Well, you know, when I first started dabbling around in social media, probably, gosh, it's been about 10 years ago, I was afraid about giving away my privacy. Back then, you know, that's the kind of thing we were worried about. Now we just, you know, we just give it all, give it all away pretty much um, on social media. But back then we were actually worried about it. And so I didn't think I would do it, but then I have a favorite author and her name is Jan Silvius. She is known for her wisdom and I heard she was tweeting. And so I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll open a Twitter account. I won't put my picture up there. I won't put my profile up there. I'll just put my name, Laura Acuna, that's it. And I'll follow one person, Jan, that's what I'll do. So that's what I did. And I waited and I waited and I waited for Jan to tweet some wisdom coming my way. And that didn't happen right away, but I did notice that I had followers and I couldn't understand it because there was no picture, there was no profile and I was tweeting nothing. Why were people following me? And so I took a look at those followers and I found out they had two common characteristics. They all were men, all of them, and they all were Hispanic men. And at the end of three weeks, I had over 150 Hispanic men following me on Twitter. <laughs> well, my three sons were living at home at the time and one of them said, mom, just Google your name. They probably have you mixed up with someone else. And I thought, oh, okay. So I typed my name into Google, Laura Acuna. I hit go and there she was, the real Laura Acuna. And I brought her picture. There she, there she is. Yep, my 150 Hispanic male followers thought they were following a Brazilian sex symbol. Well, I knew what I had to do. I had to let them down. And so I put up my picture and I put up my profile and poof, gone. 150 men gone. That's been a fun story. I take her with me almost everywhere I go. Well, you know, God often wants to teach us something important by using the ridiculous. At least I found that to be true in my life. And so I wanna ask you a question and it will actually be our very first poll question out of the box tonight. Have you ever felt the way I did? Have you ever felt that if they knew the real you, they would become disappointed and stop following you too? So we're gonna put the poll up and you're gonna have a chance to answer it. It is anonymous, you can be honest. Have you ever felt the way I did? If your followers knew the real you, would they be disappointed and go away too? Ooh, sometimes, okay, okay. I think that's fair, sometimes, um, all the time, some never, okay. So if you are one of those people who feels um, that way sometimes or all the time, the root of that is shame and I'm well acquainted with it. We often think that guilt and shame are the same thing. We think that guilt and shame are the same sides of two sides of the same coin, if you will. But guilt says you've done something wrong. You need to fix it. Holy Spirit repentance. So where guilt says you did something wrong, shame says you're something wrong and there's no fixing it. There's something really wrong with you. See the difference? That's shame and it's not from your God. Well, my shame story started when I was in the seventh grade and I was 11 years old. That was a very long time ago. I entered the seventh grade at five feet tall and 100 pounds. And by the time I left, just a few years later, I had gained over 100 pounds. I doubled my weight and grew an inch or two. To give you a visual, I went from a size five to a size 22 in a very short amount of time. And as women, and especially women who have taken time to come to a webinar on food strongholds, you know very well how devastating that was for me. It was like a bomb went off and everything changed. No one recognized me. I would go to family gatherings, you know, where you see people once or twice a year. And my aunts and uncles and cousins didn't know who I was. 
I changed that much. It was truly like a bomb went off and no one knew why. No one knew why. It was shocking. It was shocking to me. It was shocking to my parents. It was shocking to my grandparents, educators, everyone around me. We were just all shocked. And since it was 1970, the dark ages, no one knew what to do with the little girl who had gained 100 pounds in a short amount of time. So little was known about eating disorders and probably nothing about disordered eating. They knew about anorexia for sure and probably bulimia. But when a little girl gains a bunch of weight and isn't um, doing either one of those things, doesn't have either one of those eating disorders, it's a motivation issue in 1970. It's a laziness issue in 1970. And I was told, you know, you just eat too much and you need to stop. So my mother took me to Weight Watchers at 11 years old. And that began my love-hate relationship with all things food exchanges, dieting, points, calories, shakes, you know the drill. A love-hate, mostly hate relationship with those things and forcing my body to do something it was not created to do. That list was cringeworthy, <laughs> but I'm sure many of you are with me on it. So there were so many consequences, I'm sure you can imagine. But one major fallout that I experienced almost immediately was I went from being a gifted and talented student with A's and B's to failing in school almost immediately. No one knew what that was about either. And I thought that if I left middle school, junior high school, and went on to high school, that things would change for me. I thought, you know, I'll get out of the, the, the junior high school, I'll go to high school, I'll be happy, and the weight will come off. But that was fantasy thinking, because I was looking, even then at 13, 14 years old, for something external to fix something internal in me. And it doesn't work that way, but I didn't know that then. So I took all my problems with me to high school, and I call those my accordion body years, because I would lose it and gain it and lose it and gain it and lose it and gain it. And the summer before my senior year in high school, when I wanted to be skinny for graduation, I decided to starve myself all summer long. I went on a diet that was no more than 350 calories every single day. And when I went back in June, I had lost a lot of weight, 50 pounds, but I'd also lost half my hair because my hair was falling out because I was starving myself. Ironically, by June, when I graduated, I'd already gained it all back. By this time, the failures were mounting and I graduated from high school by the skin of my teeth. I couldn't, away, couldn't go away to college with my girlfriends because of my grades. And so I went to our local community college instead. At that time, I thought to myself, okay, I'm out of the school system now. I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna be happy. And all the weight's just gonna come off. And there was that fantasy thinking again, looking for externals to fix what was broken inside of me. I ended up with an epic fail in community college. I spent four years trying to get a two year degree and I didn't even come close. I attempted 129 credits during those years. 92 of them were Fs. I left with 29 credits. When I finally quit after four years and all of them were electives. At that point, all of my friends were graduating from four-year universities and I was nowhere. And when I looked back on the 10 years, 11 years since this all started, I saw nothing but rubble. And I asked myself and I asked God, why? Why can some girls go to college for four years, graduate and start their big brand new wonderful lives? Why can some girls eat normally and stay at a natural weight? but I can't. And why did I gain 100 pounds when I was 11? It was during that time when I had, I guess we would have called it a movie back then, but I call it a video now. I had this video that played in my head over and over again. There was this door, it had a window in it. And when I looked through that window, I saw this huge wide field. And in that field were all my girlfriends, all my friends who had just graduated from college and they were out in this field, skinny, and exercising all of their choices. And when I tried to go through that door, I was locked out. 
There were words that I spoke to myself. Maybe you have words that you speak to yourself too. Fat, ugly, stupid, crazy. And then I had phrases that I liked to say over myself. They were like this, you're uneducated, you're unqualified, and there's something really wrong with you. Do you hear the shame in those words? Do you hear the shame? It was unbearable. I've known God all my life. I have had the gift of knowing and loving Jesus since a, a, when I was a very, very little girl. And I knew before all this happened to me, I actually knew that God had a purpose and a plan for my life and he had gifted me for it. And it was gonna be wonderful. And I couldn't wait to grow up and, and serve him in that way. But now I felt like God was saying to me, you know, Laura, I had this plan A life for you. It was awesome and I gifted you for it, but I can't work with this. I can't work with you. So here's plan B, do with it what you can. Good luck. Now I know that that wasn't true, but I didn't know it at the time. And I walked in that false belief of him actually taking the calling away from me for decades. The voice of shame, I like to call him the shamer. We know who he is. He's the enemy of our souls. The shamer tells you you're done, even at 11 years old. Shame costs us, and it costs me a lot. But I think what it really cost me, what cost me the most, was that I developed an unbiblical idea about God and about his intentions toward me. And the most heartbreaking part, and it's heartbreaking for me to even think of it now, is that I thought the voice of the shamer belonged to him. After my epic fail in school, you may be surprised, I was, that I met and married my husband, Pat. We had been friends for years and then we suddenly started dating and I realized that for the first time in my life, really, someone loved me completely unconditionally. He did not care what, my, what the, the scale said. He didn't care, he loved me. He wanted me to be happy and healthy and whole, that's all. And he's loved me unconditionally for almost 38 years. So I'm telling you this not to brag on my, my marriage. I'm telling this to you because it didn't fix me. My marriage didn't fix me. Oh, I thought it would. I truly thought it would. I thought when I got this engagement ring on my finger, I was going to be happy. Are you kidding? I have this great guy who loves me. I'm going to be happy and the weight's going to come off. But here's the thing. Only God can fix what he's created. Only God. Only God can redeem a life, restore a life, and rep repair the broken parts of us. Only God. And it's really not fair to expect anyone, our husband, our children, um, anyone to do that for us. The love of a good man is a blessing, and I don't want to minimize that, but a man cannot fix you. The shamer was still telling me even then that there was nothing left for me. Now, I knew my husband was plan A. I just want to say that. <laughs> I never thought he was plan B. I don't know how I managed it, but he was definitely plan A, and he still has been. And as time went on, Pat and I, along with our, now we had three sons, um, we joined a growing church and I was in, introduced for the first time to women's Bible studies. And I just want to say, and aside here and plug safe, biblical women's Bible studies. They are the best incubator for us to grow and mature and heal. Uh, Vicki Heath, who's on here tonight, our first place for health national director says this. She says, if we could do it on our own, we would have done it by now. That is true. We need a circle of women godly women around us to point us to him over and over again and remind us of his faithfulness. As my faith grew and I learned to line up my thinking with the truth from God's word, I began to recognize the sweet voice of my savior. And it was in stark contrast to the shaming voice that I've been listening to for so long. And after some measure of healing and in time, God began to nudge me to return to school. And I was terrified. In fact, I, I initially said no. 
I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm not doing it. I'd had um, actually nightmares about returning to school. I was very traumatized, mostly by the thought of facing my transcript. It scared the life out of me. But after some uh, pressure um, that God you know, does when he wants to move us from one place to another, I got up one morning and the Lord and I together, we went to the local community college where I flunked out 30 years earlier and we faced the transcript together. And when I looked at it, when I saw it for the first time, there were so many Fs. There were so many Fs just jumping off the page at me, 92 credit failures. But at that moment, my 50-year-old self looked at my 20-year-old self. And suddenly, instead of hating her, I had compassion on her. That's what healing does. We start to make peace with the parts of us that are hurting. That's the fruit of healing. God is so good. I didn't hate her anymore. This little girl was depressed back then with no help. She had anxiety and crippling fear, but no one really understood. She was drowning in her emotions and her fears, but there was no rescue. She was utterly misunderstood but now finally, the grown up me, I was beginning to understand. I returned to school to finish what my younger self could not. I had to start over from the beginning, English 101. <laughs> and I went to school for five years. I graduated from Liberty University with a degree in Christian counseling and a minor in biblical studies. And I brought my graduation picture. <laughs> that was almost seven years ago, hard to believe. And when you look at, that, at me in that picture, that gold cord around my neck signifies something. It signifies that my current transcript no longer says 92 credit failures. My current transcript says 4.0. That's a summa cum laude um, cord around my neck there. And only God, only God could do that. Believe me, only God. So I have another poll question for you. Do you have an obstacle that is in the way of your freedom, like my transcript was? A fear, a mountain in your life that you fear facing? Do you have something like that in your life? If you do, he goes with you. He goes with you. And that mountain turns into a little molehill. You end up jumping over it. <laughs> Here we go. Yes. I'm not surprised. I am not surprised, girls. We have things that we fear facing. Our God is a redeemer and a repairer and a restorer of broken thinking, broken hearts, and broken dreams. He's all those things to me, and he is for you too. And if he never delivered me from another thing in my life, this would have been more than enough more than enough. I can go to heaven very happy. He is so kind. He is so faithful. And he wasn't finished rescuing me yet. So by now you may be wondering, what the heck does a college story have to do with food strongholds? When I thought I was coming here for food. Well, it has everything to do with food because it's actually not about food. It's about the broken parts of us that keep us from being free. Our issues around overfeeding and underfeeding our bodies of playing games with food have nothing to do with food. It is an emotional, mental, spiritual, and eventually it becomes a physical problem. The first step in my healing was to overcome my fear of fear and failure. The next step was healing me from what had hurt me and caused me so much heartache for so many years. After my graduation, I thought this was interesting. After my graduation, a well-meaning therapist who'd actually helped me a lot said to me, you know, now that you've graduated from school and you've done so well, the weight's just going to come off. And you all have been listening to this enough right now to know that was fantasy thinking. <laughs> that was fantasy thinking. There was still so much work to do. And my moment, I think we all have a moment. My moment came only 10 months after my graduation, when both my mother 
and my dearest oldest friend, she was like a sister to me, Mary Lou, died suddenly out of the blue, both of them within three months of each other. There was no preparation. I have no sisters, but Mary Lou, who had been my friend for 55 years was my sister. It was truly like losing mom and a sister at the same time. And because of these profound losses, I came face to face with my tipping point. Up until that moment, to be honest, I'm an Olympic level stuffer, world-class, world-class. I could stuff any emotion, any time, slap a big, beautiful smile on it and convince you I'm fine. But when this happened to me, especially when Mary Lou died right after my mother, I remember saying in that moment when I discovered um, what was going on, I said to God, um, it's too much. It's too much. It's, it's all the words I could get out of my mouth at that moment. And he said to me in my spirit, it is too much for you, but it's not too much for me. Give it to me. Give it to me. It was unmanageable. It was unmanageable. I was hurting. I was traumatized by both losses. I didn't know how I was going to go live on living without them. And I was angry. I was really angry. And anger is not an emotion that I was very familiar with because I stuffed that one really well. I needed help. So I prayed like crazy. I prayed like crazy, um, asking God to help me. And he led me to a therapist who specializes in eating disorders, body image, and trauma. And if we had more time tonight, I would love to unpack trauma with you because there's so much of our stories that are tied to traumas that happen to us in our early life. I had no idea what I was getting into by going to see a therapist who specialized in disordered eating, eating disorders, body image, and all those things, but I was willing to do anything to get relief from the pain that I was in at that time. And I began to do work, the work, with my brilliant, caring, and expert therapist. She's an angel. And if I talk about her, I'll cry. <laughs> She's an angel. She was sent to me by God and she's been my guide. As she has led me through the truth about my life, my childhood, and the damaging, confusing messages I received by well-meaning parents, I wanna say there's been a tremendous amount of forgiveness. She taught me not to fear my feelings and emotions, but to let them out safely. She led me to rediscover my true self and how to be comfortable being me. She helped me to embrace my story and I learned how to give myself grace. She showed me how shame-filled I was and taught me how to eradicate it from my life. She taught me to trust and connect with my body. She ta I mean, taught me to respect my body. And she told me and taught me that if I treated it well, it would re respond and find its healthy size. Romans 12, two says this, do not be conformed by the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word transformed in that verse, the Greek word, the original Greek word is metamorpho. And it means this, it means to be changed into something completely new, permanently changed. The word renew in that scripture means this, to make new, moving from one stage into a more developed one, continual renewal and a renewing process. And this is exactly how God works to mature and heal us when we're ready to get well. My very kind and patient counselor, along with the Lord's leading, continued to help me heal. I was, and I still am, and I always will be, applying his word to my life for growth and change. I do it daily, and I line up my thinking with the truth of his word. It's not perfect. It's not perfect. It never will be. But that's my practice. We never actually have worked on food. We've worked on me. And I love this saying that is so dear to me. And I believe this with my whole heart. Psychology reveals, but Jesus heals. Psychology is a wonderful thing. We know so much about how the brain works and heals, but only Jesus heals. Can I get an amen in the chat? I already got one. I'm getting a bunch of them. <laughs> I am. Sometimes we need wise, godly guides to help us navigate our way through the chaos of disordered eating and tangled emotions that we've been avoiding. 
But make, make no mistake, it's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who does the healing. All of it. All of it. We need to cooperate, but he's the healer. So Jesus, my therapist, and I have done quite a bit of excavating over the past few years. A lot has been brought to light. A lot has come to the surface and been unearthed. Some of it, to be honest, was very, very painful. But eventually, as I stuck with it, keyword there, the healing came and it is not painful anymore. And there has been, as I said, remarkable forgiveness. Back to Romans 12 too. When we think of metamorphosis, I know we all think about the butterfly, right? Well, when we think of the butterfly, all of the transformation that happens to the caterpillar inside the cocoon happens where no one can see. It's all going on in the cocoon, but nobody can see. But what's going on in there is amazing. She's becoming her true mature self. She's becoming exactly what her creator created her to be, a butterfly. She's doing what she was created to do, to be transformed and to fly free. She won't end up just being a better version of a caterpillar. She is being transformed into something completely new. And only the caterpillar and her creator in that secret place knows what's going on and what's happening while she's being transformed. And then when the transformation is complete, the butterfly breaks free from that cocoon, that shelter, and she can fly. Our God changes us from the inside out, not the outside in. So much of our transformation happens before anything is visible on the outside. This is so true, girls. For a time, it's just between you and your creator. And when I think of the renewal of my own mind, lining up my um, thinking with the straight edge of God's word, it is truly a continual process, but I can tell you, as I talk to you tonight, my thinking regarding my body, my healing, my outdated and obsolete coping mechanisms that I used for way too long, all of that has completely changed. And here's the amazing truth. I have experienced incredible freedom and I experienced it before I ever lost a pound. Oswald Chambers says this, you will never cease to be the most amazing, amazed person on earth as, as to what God has done for you on the inside. And I just massacred that. So let me try that again. <laughs> you will never cease to be the most amazed person on earth at what God has done for you on the inside. That's better. My story is a long and winding one. I'm 62 years old. There's simply too much to tell tonight. And I have already just skimmed the surface on so many God stories and so many ways that he has healed me. But I wanna give you enough tonight to give you some things to think about and give you some things to talk to God about. And I wanna to say too, that this is my story. This is my story. This is not necessarily everyone's story. I'm not an expert on you. I am um, only becoming and learning how to be an expert on me at this point. So I'm sharing this because I'm hoping that your story will connect with mine and you will leave here with some hope. So just as the savior's voice is in stark contrast to the voice of the shamer, so are his ways. The shamer brings severe restrictions and legalism regarding food and how we treat our bodies. It's so harsh and it's so unkind. But listen to Jesus's way from Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Listen to Jesus. Are you tired, worn out? burned out on religion, legalism, come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I love that. I knew I had to give up dieting. I just couldn't do it anymore, but I had this very fixed and rigid belief. And this is where our mind really needs to be transformed because a lot of us have black and white thinking and it's very fixed and rigid. I strongly believed that giving up dieting meant giving up my dream, the dream, the elusive dream of losing the weight and keeping it off. I just couldn't bear giving up my dream. I couldn't, I couldn't bear it. 
dieting was my security blanket. And oddly enough, it made me feel like I was in control when I truly wasn't. Author Janine Roth says this, weight loss does not make people happy or peaceful. Being thin does not address the emptiness that has no shape or weight or name. Even a wildly successful diet is a colossal failure because inside the new body is the same sinking heart. That was so true of my life. So finally, with the, with the guidance of my angel therapist and with the help of God, I walked away and I gave up dieting for good. And to be honest, I did give up of quite a few things when I walked away from dieting, but my dream was not one of them. My dream was not one of them. So I wanna share with you a few things that I've given up over the past few years. They're not carbs, they're not sugar, and they're not butter. They're, I've given up the way I used to think. They're related to my thinking because that's where, the, that's where the battle is, girls. It's in your mind. It's not on your plate. Proverbs 4.23 says this, be very careful about what you think for your thoughts run your life. Our thoughts run our lives. And if they're false thoughts, so dangerous. So I'm not skinny yet, but I'm free. I no longer use food for something it was not intended for. I no longer distract and numb myself by overeating, and I haven't for a really long time. And although I'm not skinny yet, I'm well on my way to my dream because I've discovered, and it's actually played out in my life, that when you are free enough to treat your body and your mind with care and respect, they together, together will respond and heal. And yes, my body is responding and healing and it is finding its way to the right size for me. So from here on out, I'm gonna to refer to food strongholds as, um, as disordered eating. And this term covers a broad range of ways we use food um, in ways that it wasn't intended for because I understand in a group this large from so many places, not all of you overfeed your bodies, some of you underfeed your bodies, and some of you play with food, play, play games with food, have all kinds of rules and regs around eating and other things as well. So we're gonna call it disordered eating. I think it's the best term. So before I begin um, this portion of the, the message, which is going to give you um, some of the things that I've given up and why, um, I wanna give you a picture of the typical woman or young girl who developed an eating disorder, disordered eating. Along the way, I've done a little research on the typical woman with disordered eating, and it's not a black and white thing. So, you know, we're, we're not thinking black and white here. Um, it's not a black and white thing. We're all different. We all have vastly different experiences and, and things that have happened in our lives. But as disordered eating has been studied, a typical personality has emerged. So I'm paraphrasing the work of Dr. Anita Johnston, who is a recognized expert on women with disordered eating. The typical woman with disordered eating picked up very early in life that her emotions needed to be tamped down, hidden away, and silenced. She often felt she was too much and not enough all at the same time. Many report they had per a pervasive sense of not fitting in of not seeing things the way others did and of being a misfit. Naturally intuitive and sensitive, this posed a problem for her. Her family for one reason or another did not appreciate her sensitivity, perspective or honesty. She often received the message, sometimes nonverbal, that her outspoken questioning behavior was not okay because keeping the peace in the family was the top priority. There would be no rocking the family boat. So she did what anyone with limited choices would do. And as children, we have very little choices. She complied, she silenced herself, she denied her intuition and voluntarily dimmed her light. She did it by turning to food for comfort and dieting for some measure of control. This childhood and adolescent experience is part of my long and winding story. This um, typical girl, with an eating disorder is me. I lived this life. This is my why. And when I discovered this truth, not too long ago, I sobbed. I'm telling you, I had a 
sobbing that's it in my living room when I read this information because up until that moment I honestly thought I was the only one I didn't know I was typical anything anything and I thought that the attributes that God had given me that he designed me with my true self who I really am really was were flaws instead of gifts oh how the shamer distorts what is good every single time. So now we've been together for oh, about 40 minutes. And I hope this far in, you understand that you're not alone. You're not alone. So here are a few things for the rest of my message. I want to give you, hopefully, things to think about and things to talk to God about. This is the Reader's Digest version of the Reader's Digest version of what I've given up and I've gained so much. The first thing I did was I gave up dieting and I've already told you that. My mantra is I'm not dieting, I'm healing. I'm not dieting, I'm healing. Jeremiah 8:11 says this, for they have treated the brokenness of the daughter of my people superficially saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. In Jeremiah's time, people were looking at false prophets and teachers who were telling them everything was gonna be okay. And it wasn't. There was a lot of bad stuff going on. And Jeremiah is lamenting that the people believe the false prophets, believe the false teachers and priests, instead of turning to God, the only one who could bring, bring peace and heal. Change was required and repentance was required, and they didn't want to do it. Instead, they turned to their human, their human guides instead of their godly guides, and there was no true and lasting peace. And truly, I've done the same thing. I've placed my faith, faith in a diet industry with all its quackery. Instead of peace, I ended up in a debilitating uh, cycle of defeat. I misplaced my trust in programs and plans that made light of what was going on inside of me, my real issues. Their interests lay in quick fixes that they called victories and after pictures of women that tell nothing of what was really going on inside their heads and their souls and can tell you how long they actually kept the weight off. They called success promises. And they said, I could, if I could lose the weight like they have, I could be skinny and I could be free too. It was in the very, 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 very fine print at the bottom of those plans and those promises where they wrote, results are not typical, just to cover themselves in case the promise didn't come through for me. This billion dollar industry with my full permission treated my wounds superficially, promised me peace when there was none to be found. And even when I lost the weight, there was no peace because I was afraid I'd gain it back and my brokenness was still there anyway. So as I've told you before, my story is a long and winding one and yours is too. It may not be 62 years long, but it's long and winding too. We've, we've lived some life, haven't we? It took a long time for me to understand that I'd placed my trust in all the wrong places. But God is so patient and he's so kind and he knows how we are. He knows we want quick fixes and instant results. So when I gave up dieting and I embraced healing, I learned a few things that I think are important to share with you tonight. Healing is not a quick fix. Healing will follow a different path than a diet will. Healing is not about food, it never was. Healing will take as long as it takes. Everyone's different. Everyone's story's different. Everyone, everyone's healing is different. Healing leads to freedom. Only healing leads to freedom. And healing comes from Jehovah Rapha, one of the Old Testament names for God, which means I am the God who heals you. When Jesus healed people, if you remember your New Testament stories, he healed them of their infirmities, body and spirit but he also restored their sense of belonging and he took away their shame. Jeremiah 30, 17 says, but I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord. I gave up shame. I gave it up totally. It took a while. Romans 10, 11 says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. And this includes the shaming attitude toward myself, which I detailed for you earlier, shaming the shaming voice of others toward me, 
refusing to accept shame from the culture, which is rampant. And once you recognize it, it's everywhere. Refusing to accept, accept shame from um, the culture and the, I mean, the dieting culture, the language, the shaming language and the shaming mindset of the diet culture, got it out. So here's just some of the ways the diet culture has not only infused shame into us, but we actually spit it back out. So here we go. I'm being bad. I'm being bad today. I'm cheating. I am cheating. I hate how I look. I have to exercise to undo what I did to myself over the weekend with food. I have to starve myself all week and eat salads for dinner because I ate too much over the weekend. I can't have what everyone else is having because I'm fat. I'll just have the salad. Diets work, but I don't work. Something's really wrong with me. Now look, there's a lot, there's a lot more. I'm sure that you could detail them yourselves, but Giving up shame is not an easy thing to do when you've lived with it, when it is, it is um, a voice in your, in your head, you know, for so many years. So all of these things that I'm telling you that I've given up took time and practice. These were not instant quick fixes at all. It took work, but God is faithful and he gives you plenty of opportunities to practice your new skills, believe me. <laughs> and um, he's with us all the way, all the way. We learn to replace guilt and shame or shame uh, mostly with self-compassion and grace. We learn to distinguish the sweet voice of our savior from the voice of the shamer. I gave up hiding from the truth of my life. Psalm 51, six says, behold, you delight in truth in my inward being. You teach me wisdom in the secret heart. When we allow ourselves to feel the things that we've avoided so long, stories will start to bubble up memories and narratives in our life. And it's important not to run away from them, not to um, you know, feed them a lot of chocolate and numb ourselves, but to actually sit in those stories and ask God, what do you want me to glean from this? These are important things that we need to learn and not avoid. In Nehemiah 4, when the people began to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, scripture tells us that before any rebuilding could be done, the rubble had to be cleaned out first. And that's what we have to do. We sit with our stories. We look at our broken spots. We try to make sense of what's happened in our lives with self-compassion and curiosity, not self-condemnation or self-pity. And we clear the rubble before we rebuild. So we pick up the truth of our story. We go there. We go there. And we allow him to help us make sense of it all. I gave up stuffing my feelings and emotions. Psalm 62, eight says, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us, Selah. And that word Selah that comes after the Psalm tells us that we can trust him, that we can pour our heart out to him and that he's our refuge and he is. That word Selah actually means to stop and listen, to pause and praise. Tiffany Rowe, in a more secular way, says, we've got to feel, heal, and deal. <laughs> but really and truly, girls, when we feel those emotions coming up, I don't know about you, but my normal reaction to an unpleasant emotion was to straight head to the straight, um, to head straight to the refrigerator and open the door and stick my head in it. I can remember my mother telling me that, like, you just walk over there and stick your head in, you don't, I don't even know what you're doing. It was because it was a reaction to an unpleasant emotion I didn't want to think about or feel about. So now I go sit, I, I acknowledge it, I sit in it, I process it with God and the anxiety lifts. I love this scripture that describes that so well. Here's what I want you to do. This is Matthew 6, 6. Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. I gave up hating my body. This was the hardest part of all, hardest part of all. It took a long time. Every time my therapist would say, how are you feeling about your body today? Not good. But one day after a lot of healing, I went in there and I, she said, how are you feeling about your body today? And I said, I like her. And we both cried. We both cried. 
I had another deeply rooted and rigid belief. I believed that if I, if I loved, which was outrageous to me, loving your body or even accepted my body or even said it was somewhat okay, I'd have to accept being overweight for the rest of my life. I believe that. It's another very rigid, drilled in belief that takes time and practice to get rid of. First Corinthians 16, I'm sorry, 619 says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Now we know this scripture and many times I've been very convicted by this scripture. I don't know about any of you. That could be a poll question. Have you been convicted by this scripture? We all have. And you know, we should be. Yeah. I see Helen going, yep. Um, and we should be because repentance is part of the process of healing. It is. It really is. I'm not skipping over that. But for tonight, can we look at this verse through the lens of grace? Can we also hear it saying to us that this body that we're walking around in right now is the temple of the Holy Spirit? It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is the house of our eternal soul. Do we understand this? I mean, do, do we really? Do we really? And if so, if we can at least acknowledge it might be true, then can we agree that God would not house his spirit and our eternal souls in a dysfunctional, loathsome dwelling? Is he a slumlord? No, no. Psalm 139, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And I have learned that you can still love and respect your body and not be satisfied with where it is right now. It's not black or white. We can love it. We can respect it. We can say it needs some tweaking. It needs some improving. That's okay. We can still love and respect our body and still want what's best for it. But the truth is, the truth is, you cannot hate your body into getting well. You can't do it. It doesn't work that way. We can, when we connect with our bodies and begin to honor and respect them, we will move them because that's what our bodies need. Not harsh exercise or rigid, you know, crazy things with exercise, but with the mindset that we're treating our body well and it needs to move. We sleep better. We have better digestive systems. We think better. We're calmer. We anxiety comes down um, with good food, rest, and movement. And as for feeding our bodies, our body was made to be nourished by good food. Our body was made to be nourished by good food, all four food groups, all four. Our soul was created to be nourished by God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our souls, girls, were never meant to be nourished by food. Jesus answered in Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And then I love this quote by someone I don't know, but I found it. Nayira Wahid says this. And I said to my body softly, I want to be your friend. It took a long breath and replied, I've been waiting my whole life for this. I love this. I love this quote. I eventually stopped hating my body. I now respect the way my body is made. My body is a vessel for life. It's a temple and a house for the Holy Spirit and for my eternal soul. Our bodies are remarkable and, and amazing. And girls, they were meant to heal. When we treat them well, they're meant to heal. I fired the food police. I fired them, defunded all of them, got rid of them. <laughs> I honestly believe there are no bad foods. We honor our body and the way God made them by eating whole good food the cleaner, the better. When we rightly view food as just food, just food, and understand it was provided by God to fuel our bodies, the ones he designed to be fed by that food, when we treat them well, eventually we learn to make the choices that are best for us. And that includes how much and what food we decide to eat. As we learn to trust our hunger cues, that's a big one, learning when I'm actually hungry and when I'm actually full, then I learned to be satiated. That's a big step for a lot of us. It was for me. I had no idea what hungry felt like or full. I, I really didn't. I had to be taught that. But I can tell you now, when I'm eating three square meals a day with snacks if I need them, in moderation, within um, the boundaries that I have decided work for me, 
I am satiated. And when I'm satiated, I'm calm. And when I'm calm, I'm not obsessing about food anymore. It's as simple as that. That is freedom, no matter what the scale says. Again, Janine Roth, and we're coming to the end. If you pay attention to when you're hungry, what you're eating, when you've had enough, and you, end, you, you will end the obsession and, because obsession and awareness cannot exist together. Obsession and awareness cannot exist together. God gave us food for pleasure too, and that's okay. We can have a piece of cheesecake once in a while, and this is what we do. We move on. We don't starve ourselves the next day. We don't beat ourselves up for it. We make a choice, a big girl, grown-up choice. I'm going to have the cheesecake tonight. I'm not going to have two. I'm not going to have four. I'm going to have one, and then I'm going to move on. When we connect to our bodies, our feelings, and listen to them both, food falls into its rightful place in our lives, and the emotional charge and the power is gone. It's gone. And I gave up believing I needed to be skinny to be free. Freedom doesn't equal skinny girls and skinny doesn't equal freedom. If we're honest, we know plenty of women who are at their ideal weight and they're still wrapped around the axle about food. Skinny does not equal freedom. Some of us have been skinny women who are wrapped around the axle with food. I was and have been. I want to tell you a quick story about the Restore Me conference that First Place for Health uh, puts on. Helen mentioned that I met everybody there um, for the first time two years ago. And I went as a participant. And when I walked in, the, I'd never been to anything like that. It is a retreat for women who suffer with the things I suffer with. And so I went to the retreat. I walked in the room and I immediately, immediately saw a woman who was quite a bit larger than me. And my reaction was pity. I, I, I just, I was brokenhearted. I felt sad for her. I judged her in the most caring kind way, but I made a lot of assumptions about her that were wrong. I assumed that because she was so much larger than me, that she was not free. I made the assumption that she was just beginning her journey. I made the assumption that she had a really long way to go. And then I met her. And when I met her, I found out that she'd been on the healing path for a long time and she had already lost an, a lot, a lot of weight. She was moving her body. She was eating food as fuel and taking very good care of herself. And she was free. And I was not at all at that time. And I saw a beautiful picture that her body was still healing, but her mind was already healed. That's how it works sometimes for us. So I, I was like my friend. I have had the same experience that I've had freedom in my mind and my heart and my soul and my body is still healing. I gave up believing that there's no freedom without losing weight. That's not true. You can be free before that happens. And so, yes, we may need to give up some things when we give up dieting or we step onto the healing path but we're not giving up the dream to be healthy and whole. We're not. We're not giving up on the dream to become the woman that we were created to be from the very beginning. And that's a four-sided person with all of our parts working together in harmony, body, heart, mind, and spirit. Second Corinthians 4, 16 to 18 says this. So we're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside, it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. And again, there's that word grace. There it is again. It's so hard to understand. Sometimes it's hard to receive. It's even hard to give. But we've got to get it. We've got to get it. We must. So as I'm ending, I want to share a scripture that's particularly meaningful to me, and I think it will be for you too. Listen to the imagery in these verses. It's Romans uh, 5, 1 to 2 from the message. By entering into faith, into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right with him, make us fit for him, we have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. And that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown the door open to us. We find ourselves standing 
where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. There it is. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. The door, girls, has always been open for us. We're the ones who keep it locked. Amen? So I hope you've been encouraged to leave behind what has never worked. And maybe, just maybe, go to God and talk to him about your healing. I'm praying that you will, if you have not already, I'm not assuming that you haven't, but if you haven't, will you take the first step into walking into true freedom to become your true self, body, mind, heart, and soul. God loves you. He truly loves you. He has not given up on you. He has not, he is not done with you. He is not done with you. He wants to extend his grace and he will stay with you every step of the way until you're free. And then he'll keep with you after that. Psalm 1819 says this, he brought me out into a wide open place. He rescued me because he was pleased with me. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.